Guatemalan President Alejandro Diamate announced on Friday that deportations of Guatemalans from the United States will be suspended until further notice after a spike in coronavirus cases among those returning to the country. U.S. President Donald Trump has tweeted calling to liberate Michigan, Minnesota and Virginia, three states in which social distancing orders have been put in place by Democratic governors. China continues to extend its support for African nations in the fight against the coronavirus pandemic, offering aid and medical expertise. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South. I'm Katrina Goss. People in Bolivia's El Alto region are working to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 virus by using ancestral knowledge. Residents of the country's second largest city say they want to prevent an outbreak by inhaling vapours created with eucalyptus and chamomile plants, which are known to free up the respiratory tract. The de facto government has failed to carry out widespread testing or provide citizens with proper preventive measures, so people have turned to their ancestral knowledge to face the pandemic. Eucalyptus has also seen a spike in use by indigenous communities in other Andean nations, such as Peru and Ecuador. Guatemalan President Alejandro Diamate announced on Friday that deportations of Guatemalans from the United States will be suspended until further notice after a spike in coronavirus cases among those returning to the country. Starting today and until the agreement signed by the two countries is fulfilled, which gives us the certainty that this poll will come with a certificate that shows us that they are free of the coronavirus the flights of deportees are suspended. We have 21 new cases that make a total now of 235 cases. 21 people recovered and we have lost seven people of whom are dead. Of these cases that we mentioned today, they are people who came on Monday on a flight of deportees from the US. Most of the people on that flight are infected with COVID-19. Healthcare workers at a hospital in Argentina have called on the hospital board to provide safe working conditions and mass testing, just as the government announced that 14% of those who have been infected with the novel coronavirus are medical workers. Argentina has reported over 2,700 confirmed COVID-19 cases and almost 130 fatalities. The hospital board accepted to do the massive test. We are going to do it in batches. The unions are going to control and regulate what was agreed upon to give us supplies. We still maintain the position that if we do not have the necessary equipment to circulate inside the hospital, it will not work. Do we want it to be taken as an example? Not what the background did wrong, but this solution that we are achieving today, the workers of the hospital, the union representatives, so that it is taken into account in other hospitals. The lockdown to combat COVID-19 in Honduras has forced hundreds to take to the streets to beg for help, while many others are now living in them due to a lack of work. We have more in the following report. In Tegucigalpa, circus workers from Guatemala are unable to return to their home country due to the lockdown imposed to fight the pandemic. They now must ask for money on the streets in order to survive. We've been here for a while asking for people's help and thankfully they are helping us. Whatever little people can contribute, we split among ourselves. With that, we can buy some food, diapers, detergent. 70% of Honduras' population lives under the poverty line, out of which 48% live in extreme poverty, a situation that has been aggravated following the closure of most businesses. We've seen a massive increase in poverty. This is not only a health crisis, but a social and economic crisis as well. This is starting to get out of hand. Street vendors have been hit the worst by the crisis to the point many are now living on the streets. We sleep where we can, sometimes paying for a bedroom, but we don't really have money, so we often stay out on the street. 
Adults and children ask for help on the outskirts of major cities where help offered by the government has yet to arrive. We are asking for help from the government to give us a place where we can stay. In Honduras, over 40% of people depend on the informal economy, mainly from selling goods on the street, an activity that is now banned due to the health emergency. Jamaican authorities announced that 32 new COVID-19 cases were recorded in a 24-hour period, taking the total to 163. All but one of the new cases was linked to a call centre in the coastal town of Portmore. Meanwhile, a fifth COVID-19 death was reported as a 63-year-old woman from Portland. Addressing a virtual press conference yesterday, Minister of Health and Wellness Dr Christopher Tufton said the new cases comprise five males and 27 females, ranging in age from 19 to 70 year years old. Prime Minister Andrew Holness said that from 5am today until 5am next Wednesday, April 22nd, residents are expected to remain in their homes unless they have to go to work. Meanwhile, the Jamaican opposition is calling for a total nationwide lockdown to stop the spread of the coronavirus. So, having Barbados has not reported any new COVID-19 cases since Wednesday, according to the country's Ministry of Health. In the latest update issued on Friday, the ministry noted that this is the first time since the first two cases were diagnosed on March 16th that the island has not recorded any new cases of COVID-19 for two consecutive days. The country has so far reported 75 confirmed cases of the virus, while five people have died, 15 have recovered and 55 are undergoing treatment. And we're taking a very short break now, but stay with us for more. Welcome back to From the South. U.S. President Donald Trump has tweeted calling to liberate Michigan, Minnesota and Virginia, three states in which social distancing orders have been put in place by Democratic governors. The series of tweets were quickly rebuked by the Democratic leaders of all three states. The United States now accounts for nearly a third of the 2.25 million coronavirus cases reported globally. It has also seen over 38,000 deaths, more than any other nation. Demonstrators in these three U.S. states staged public rallies this week to demand an end to the restrictions, with the largest protest in Michigan attracting 3,000 people, some of whom were armed. Trump has largely left decisions on easing lockdowns to state officials, even as he laid out guidelines for a staged reopening of the national economy. However, his tweets show he is unlikely to stop interfering with local government decisions. The governor of New York State, Andrew Cuomo, has accused the U.S. federal government of not doing enough to fight the coronavirus pandemic. And we need them to step up and work together. But the federal government cannot wipe their hands of this and say, oh, the states are responsible for testing. We cannot do it. We cannot do it without federal help. Of those three bills, the state governments have gotten precisely zero, zilch, nada in unrestricted aid. The state should this, the state should this, the state should this. Yes. Well, what support have you given the states? None. In Spain, one of the countries hardest hit by the pandemic, over 20,000 deaths have now been reported. The new deceased from yesterday to today amounts to 565. It is still a high number of deceased that would like to see decreasing as quickly as possible. But it is also true that the evolution observed during these last days show that the numbers are stabilizing in a way. But we also hope to see the same reduction as that followed this week by intensive care units. We hope that this will start to be observed also very soon on mortality rate. We are in a very obvious downward phase with transmission controls, but obviously we still have enough cases to need to be very careful. The number of people in the United Kingdom who have died in hospital from the novel coronavirus has risen to over 15,400, according to daily health ministry figures issued on Saturday. The British government has faced mounting criticism of its handling of the epidemic. On Thursday, the nationwide lockdown, introduced on March 23rd, was extended for at least three more weeks. Data shows the number of reported cases has climbed to over 114,000. 
Health Minister Matt Hancock, who had pledged to scale up testing to 100,000 tests a day by the end of April, said on Friday that priority would be given to a group of key workers like police officers, the fire service, prison staff and some government officials, among others. However, the UK remains far from its target, conducting just 21,000 tests in the most recent 24-hour period. Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered the government to provide daily forecasts of the spread of the novel coronavirus, as Russia recorded almost 5,000 new cases in a single day. On Saturday, Russia's official tally of coronavirus cases was over 36,000, with a record overnight, overnight rise of 4,785, while the death toll rose by 40 to 313. Moscow, a city of 12.7 million people, is the epicentre of Russia's coronavirus outbreak and has seen a surge in cases and fatalities. However, Mayor Sergei Sobyanin has stressed that the lockdown measures first introduced in March are bearing fruit. A charity in Venice is delivering food by gondola to elderly people or families who cannot shop for themselves. The deliveries have been organised by Row Venice, a non-profit organisation dedicated to pre preserving the traditional Phoenician rowing style. Since Italy announced a lockdown on March 8th, the city of Venice, usually packed with tourists, has been almost empty. Meanwhile, over the last 24 hours, 482 deaths were reported in Italy, according to the Civil Protection Agency, representing the first time since March 19th that the figure was below 500. Italy is the second hardest hit country in the world in terms of the number of fatalities at over 23,000. Germany's response to the crisis has received international acclaim as experts have credited Berlin for widespread testing and ample treatment capacity for COVID-19 patients. As of Saturday, Germany has reported over 142,000 confirmed cases and more than 4,400 COVID-19 fatalities. It's important to me that this isn't only tied up with death and technology. We bring most people back to life, not because of all the machines we have, but because of people who know what they're doing, who commit themselves so strongly and use the technology. We believe that we will still receive a certain number of COVID-19 patients in the next weeks or months, and we are prepared to react dynamically in case the so-called second wave turns out to be higher than we might anticipate today. The government of the Chinese province of Hubei has downgraded the epidemic risk rating for Wuhan city to low. All districts of Wuhan city moved out of the medium risk rating and all 76 cities and towns in the virus hit province are now at low risk. According to the latest coronavirus figures from the Wuhan Health Commission, a total of 50,333 COVID-19 cases were reported in Wuhan with over 46,000 recoveries and 3,869 fatalities as of Friday. And we're taking one final break now, but don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Saudi Arabia could sell one of its highest volumes of oil to the United States before the recently agreed OPEC deal comes into effect in May. The country could sell around 600,000 barrels per day of crude to its overseas ally, the US. According to an earlier report, Saudi Arabian oil shipments more than doubled from February to March to reach 25 million barrels, the highest figure since December 2018. The report claimed that April's figures were set to further skyrocket, as in the first two weeks alone, some 1.46 million barrels per day of Saudi oil were shipped to U.S. ports. Iran allowed some businesses in the capital and nearby towns to reopen this Saturday after weeks of lockdown aimed at containing the worst COVID-19 outbreak in the Middle East. Gyms, restaurants, shopping malls and Tehran's Grand Bazaar will remain closed. Holy shrines and mosques are also still closed and a ban on public gatherings remains in place. Government offices have reopened with a third of employees working from home, while schools and universities remain closed. Iran has reported more than 80,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases and over 5,000 deaths. 
74 years ago, on April 17, 1946, the Syrian people achieved their long-awaited independence after having been subjected to the will of foreign powers that decided to divide the world up as they saw fit. Today, these same countries are trying to subjugate the Arab country again in order to take over its natural resources. At the end of the First World War, faced with the inequity of the sykes picot Agreement, a neo-colonial attempt by France and the United Kingdom to redistribute control over the Middle East region from their geographical, social and political points of view, the Syrian people advocated national sentiments, ratified their Arab identity, and fought to maintain and advance the principles of a secular society. This led thousands of Syrians to defend their homeland and fight to secure their independence. At present, Syrians experiencing exceptional circumstances created by a terrorist war imposed since 2011. Half of the population, some 11.6 million people, including women and children, are the main victims of the ongoing imperialist aggression. Many have been forced to move to another territories or to take refuge in other countries. According to United Nations reports, the war in Syria has left more than 250,000 dead, as well as extensive damage to the country's infrastructure and economy, with estimates that it will take nearly 30 years for the country to recover. The people of Syria, on a new anniversary of their independence from French colonialism, have not stopped fighting for peace despite the presence of terrorists and US troops. They continue to defend their flag and the homeland they secured in 1946. Today, Syrians have plenty of reasons to celebrate Evacuation Day, Syrians National Day commemorating the evacuation of the last French soldier, and Syria's proclamation of full independence and the end of the French mandate of Syria on 17 April 1946. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang said on Thursday that the Chinese people are ready to stand together with the Sudanese people in their fight against COVID-19 and offer support and assistance. The Chinese Premier made the remarks in a phone conversation with Sudan's Prime Minister, Abdallah Hamdok. Li said that China and Sudan enjoy a deep traditional friendship, adding that the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic in Africa has recently been accelerating and the Chinese people are ready to support Sudan in its efforts to combat the virus. For his part, Hamdok said the Sudanese people appreciate China's positive role in promoting international cooperation to contain COVID-19 and oppose any acts to stigmatize certain countries. Sudan has reported 32 cases of COVID-19 and five fatalities. A large Lagos food market has been struggling to manage crowds amid Nigeria's coronavirus lockdown. Mile 12, the megacity's largest perishable food market, was on Friday crammed with traders and shoppers with little signs of social distancing. The challenges are enormous. The social distancing is very important in making sure that um, we, 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 we cope the spread of COVID-19. But, you know, in an informal market, I think the government needs to do more to make sure that um, we keep people safe and keep them at home. People must eat. I strongly believe that um, hungry is much, much uh, more dangerous than even the, uh, the coronavirus. So we must do our best to ensure that um, people get food to eat. The lockdown has been very frustrating, to, to say the truth. But if this is what we have to do to stay alive and well, then so be it. According to the most recent figures, there are over 550 confirmed cases of the novel coronavirus in Burkina Faso, while 30 people have died. Local authorities have set up two treatment centres in the capital in order to prevent the spread of the disease. Authorities have also increased measures to restrict freedoms by quarantining contaminated towns and closing markets. The president and government officials have given up several months of their salaries to support the response to the pandemic, while they have thanked all stakeholders for their commitment and determination in the fight against COVID-19. In the face of the coronavirus pandemic, we here at Telesur continue to work non-stop to offer you valuable and reliable information. We have a multimedia team that hasn't stopped despite the lockdowns to provide minute-by-minute -minute updates on what is happening across the world.
From the headquarters of Telesur English here in Havana, Fabiola Lopez offers an insight into our efforts behind the scenes. Havana looks huge and deserted in times of the coronavirus. The pandemic has put off the city's bustle and joy. From the top, everything is calm. Below, thousands are the stories to tell from the most unexpected places, even from the very newsroom where this news story was written. She is Katrina Goss, the British journalist presenting the English Telesur newscast from Havana. She has not stopped reporting since the pandemic began, but she has also stayed in touch with her loved ones in the old continent. The situation in the United Kingdom is very tough. The government took a long time to adopt measures. One thinks of the developed world and can't imagine that there were scarcities in the supermarket. My mum lives in the countryside and has hens. She went to buy some more and they were only giving out two hens per person because as there is a scarcity of eggs, it seems that many people have started to buy hens. There are crazy things happening right now. When the world is living through an unprecedented health crisis, this is what the Telesur newsrooms looks like in Havana. In the multimedia section, Alejandra's seat is empty. Now the young journalist works from her home. She was hospitalized in an isolation ward for several days under suspicion of being infected with COVID-19. Today I'm working from home after a few days of illness and hospitalization. At the end of March, I spent a few days at the Pedro Curie Institution of Tropical Medicine where, uh, as I was suspected of carrying the COVID-19. Fortunately, every single test uh, was negative, so I could return home with my family. But from those days, I remember, for example, the affection with which every single doctor treated me back then. Also, how quickly they approached to my community, to my place of work, to warn and to, uh, and to ask for extreme measures of hygiene. Journalists Regla and Yadira produce, write, edit, and manage content, but between newscasts, they live the anguish and joy of having family members who are battling COVID-19 in the front line. My first cousin is the head of ward at one of the hospitals treating patients confirmed with coronavirus. I asked him if he was afraid to be infected, but he said that uh, he was not afraid because when one chooses that kind of professions, you know this could happen. We cannot stay at home either. We are also doing our part at Telesur English. It's very difficult under these circumstances to be so far from home. My grandmother is almost 80 years. She calls me every day and cries every time. She knows that I'm working and can't stop working. I can't stop either. From Cuba, Telesur's bureau in Havana continues to chase stories and broadcast daily reports on what happened on the island. Every time I give a report, I think about my parents who are from Baracoa in the east of Cuba and who are currently isolated, suspected of having the coronavirus. I work daily while being worried about them. The world needs to be informed. Society is oversaturated with fake news in some instances. And that's why we work every day, because the world needs to be informed. These are just some of the many daily stories by those who do not stop working even in times of the novel coronavirus. At 9 p.m., they applaud for those who save lives while they report to their smart viewers, shining light on the ineptitude of capitalism in the face of global problems and showing the huge experience of great nations and the chronicles of solidarity of a small island. Fabiola López, Telesur, La Habana. And we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.